This is One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Carberline. Quantum mechanics is perhaps the most accurate theory ever devised, and yet it's one of the most subtle and difficult to understand. Why exactly is that? Today we're going to talk with Dr. Ed Hawk, Assistant Professor of Physics at the Rochester Institute of Technology, about quantum mechanics and why it happens to be so strange. So your area is quantum mechanics. It is. And it has kind of an interesting thing in that it's an extremely accurate theory, and yet it's one of those things that even most of the experts don't fully understand. Uh, It also has kind of an interesting history in that we developed it because everything else wouldn't work. I think people press quantum mechanics too hard in the sense that since it's such a beautiful and accurate theory, we expect it to explain everything to us, but it doesn't. It's just a tool. The area in which I do work is quantum mechanics, and I suppose the party line is to say quantum mechanics is the best theory because it it describes certain things in electrodynamics way beyond the limit of of, of our ability to measure them. I mean, in other words, every super detailed measurement that you do in quantum electrodynamics exactly matches what quantum electrodynamics says it should be. Like you said, everyone has an opinion, and in my opinion, in my experience, you you can't read too much into that. For instance, if you, if you want to know what are the energy levels of hydrogen, then quantum mechanics is your huckleberry. You're going to have to use that. That's the way you do it. But if you want to know, you know, why is there hydrogen in the first place, or if you want to ask cosmological questions like mm-hmm. that, it's not built for that. Or, mm-hmm. or if it is, we're not sure in what way it's built for right, that. Right, how it's built for that. Yeah, right. It is certainly the best tool in the box for calculating things in atomic and optical physics. Right, and so even, all the small scale stuff. That's, yeah. that's the regime. And, and, and honestly, um, what we mean by small scale is not necessarily cut and dried. I mean, a lot of the work I do personally has to do with uh, you know, what's generally called macroscopic quantum states. But what that really means is if you take a bunch of quantum mechanical systems like electrons and atoms and, and you bathe them in, say, coherent light, you can get fairly large collective behaviors that are very quantum mechanical. Mm-hmm. In other words, you see things like quantum entanglement and quantum interference even though you're talking about things that are on the nano scale maybe, which compared to an atom is pretty big. Right, so a billionth of a meter would be a nanometer. Right, right, right. that's about, what, 10 hydrogen atoms across? Yeah, give or take. Um, And so you'd expect, you know, in in standard textbook quantum mechanics, you expect that the hydrogen atom has energy levels and a wave function, and, and, and they kind of just turn off at the edge of the hydrogen atom, which for most practical purposes is a decent approximation to a lot of things. But they don't, they don't have to. In other words, you can get more complicated collective behaviors that are all built into um, you know, things like, as I said, quantum entanglement, quantum interference, that are really the rich pieces of quantum mechanics. That's what makes quantum mechanics quantum mechanical. Right. Uh, I think what it also kind of speaks to a lot of people is it has such, such a rich strangeness to it. Oh, it's got some strangeness you know, I mean, to it. That, I mean, and one of the things is that you'll get a lot of people who will claim that quantum theory allows anything to happen. You know, that, that, well, technically, if you push through a wall, there's a chance that you could go through the wall, or there's a chance that, you know, something would spontaneously change into something else. You get a lot of pseudoscience off of this. You know, it's, oh, quantum mechanics is a wonderful generator for pseudoscience. <laughs> we could do a whole other podcast on that. <laughs> there, there are very interesting things people can blame on the uncertainty principle. They right. have nothing to do with the uncertainty principle. <laughs> right, but if you uh, say uncertainty principle. Oh, yeah, if you have something called the uncertainty principle, you're, you're, you're painting a bullseye on yourself. Right. I mean, in the sense that, you know, if I, if I say, oh, yes, the uncertainty principle says this and that, um, people are going to want to think, well, it, if it, the uncertainty principle says we can't really know anything precisely, then how do we know anything at all? And it, right. it, it, it's not really what it says. It, right. it, it, it just places limits on how precisely something can exist in a state. The whole concept of a state is fundamental to quantum mechanics. Mm-hmm. Some folks might say that the, the concept of a state is foreign to classical mechanics, but I, I take a different take on it. I think it's so common in classical mechanics that we don't even think to talk about it. We don't think of it as a state. Not at all. We, right, we talk right. about states in chemistry, for example. Yeah. You know, the state of the gas or something, but we don't th- say the state of the baseball. No, right. But 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 the thing is, if you think about the, the motion of a baseball, it's really just a transition from one state to another to another, where every state is characterized by the position and the velocity of the ball right. at that particular point in time. So the state is, 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 the state is what it is, in almost. In other words, we... we, we, we 
classical mechanics is so intuitive that we can kind of, with our own eyes and measuring apparatus, we can measure the state continuously without disrupting it and without any kind of counterintuitive things happening. Mm -hmm. Whereas in quantum mechanics, the state is a much different thing. In other words, uh, the quantum mechanics allows us to have states that are classically sensible, like the spin up of an electron or spin down. Those are things we can easily measure. Mm -hmm. But it also allows for states that are so-called linear superpositions of the two. In other words, kind uh, of fuzzy in between. Yeah, you're kind of there's a state that, that that's sort of up plus down, which doesn't make any classical sense. Now, there are authors out there and there are people out there who try to say that this really just means that the electrons in both states at the same time. That is wrong. <laughs> That's wrong. That's not what quantum mechanics says. That kind of a state, it's a different state altogether. It's, a, it's an indefinite state. It's the genesis of the uncertainty principle, which basically says that in quantum mechanics, you can have linear superposition states, which means that classically sensible alternatives interfere with each other in a way much like light waves interfere with each other when they go through a double slit apparatus. Right. And, 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 and at a fundamental level, we have to, I mean, hundreds, a hundred years of experiments have shown that we have to allow for that possibility or else we can't explain what happens in the world with respect to things like atomic, you know, chemical bonding or something like that. Right. And it seems like a lot of our, uh, a lot of the complexity of quantum mechanics is built upon kind of our assumption of how the world should work as opposed to how it does work. That's right. That's right. I, I think, I think a, a large part of the mystery or, or, or um, confusion that surrounds quantum mechanics has to do with classical mechanics is because we're big, slow, heavy classical things with, you know, sort of cut and dried classical type int intuition. Mm -hmm. Electrons aren't. <laughs> they're, they're just fundamentally different than classical right. things. The closest I've ever, ever been able to come to in my own mind is I, this, whenever I give a talk on this stuff, I talk about a, the following scenario. Okay. So suppose, you know, you're a young student or something and you 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 see that person who's the object of your interest and you think i want to ask that person out for a date mm -hmm. and um, if you ask them out would you like to go out for dinner with me on saturday night um, an answer of yes is a classically sensible answer that that right. throws the system into a state that's a definite state or the more common answer of no <laughs> or the more common answer being a theoretical <laughs> physicist of no <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> we have lots in common, Brian. <laughs> um, that's a definite, it's a classically sensible state. But in quantum mechanics, this person who, who you've invited to dinner might say something like one over the square root of two, yes plus no. Right. So what are you supposed to think? I'm being silly, but, but that's a true state of maybe. It's not the answer's really yes, but I'm going to tell you I don't know, or the answer's really no, but I'm going to tell you I don't know. The answer is Undetermined. In it's other words, definitely it's, indeterminate. It, it's it's indeterminate. It's, it's it, we would say classically indeterminate, right? Um, because it's not in a state of yes or no. It's in a, it's truly in a physical state of maybe. Right. Uh, the way that something gets to a state of yes or no is Saturday night. Show up at the door, knock on the door, say, "Well, you ready to go out for dinner?" And then it's either gonna it's either gonna jump to yes or no because something is going to happen, right? And and that's gonna force the hand. And so in quantum mechanics, we would call that the collapse of the state vector. Mm -hmm. So if we have an electron that's in one of these, de these indefinite states of spin up and spin down, mm -hmm. I, mean, I should say it's an indefinite superposition of those two, and I do an experiment or you do an experiment that measures the spin of the electron, you are going to get an answer of either up or down, and you're going to get it with a certain probability that's absolutely predictable by quantum mechanics um, right. using some basic mathematics. Mathematics is not even really all that weird. It's linear algebra. People learn it. What quantum mechanics does is it allows us to predict those probabilities, but it still doesn't tell us what the electron is doing before we make that measurement. Well, right. the best we can say is it's in this classically indefinite state that is absolutely quantum mechanically determinate. Of course, you know, the first person to really state this eloquently was Richard Feynman, who said that, you know, inter interference is really what makes quantum mechanics quantum mechanical. Mm -hmm. And that's interference. When you have two things that are in, in a, what I keep saying, linear superposition, but basically just the sum of two different classical sensible states. Right. They're, they're interacting in a quantum mechanical way. Well, so uh, they don't yeah. have this classical definiteness that we'd like. Yeah. So, so, right. It doesn't even necessarily even require an interaction. You can just get things that have gotten themselves into that quantum mechanical state mm -hmm. and it's hopeless for human beings to try to think of what's an analogy for that because it's not there just all, isn't all analogy fails yeah. coming back to the the original point 
the only reason why we want to think something this crazy about electrons is that it works. Right. And you want to calculate something about electrons, it works. <laughs> this is One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Coverline. We've been talking with Dr. Ed Hock about the strangeness of quantum theory. Up next, we're going to talk about how do we wrap our heads around this and what it really means. So I know you and I have both taught quantum mechanics to undergraduate students, and it is a challenge to say the least, because when we teach mechanics, when we teach classical physics, they can wrap their heads around it, they can see it, they can visualize it. And then we enter quantum mechanics, and even though the mathematics is very precise, it can be very challenging for students to understand what it means. And a lot of that is because I think of we don't have a really good coherent model of what it's representing other than the mathematical description of it. I know there's a lot of different interpretations of what quantum mechanics is. There's the Copenhagen interpretation, which is probably the most popular, and then many worlds and shut up and calculate and all of these. Um, do you have a favorite one? No, I, I think it's it's important to avoid favorites in, in a thing like that. A, a lot of the models, you know, the so-called various interpretations, they're not necessarily as different from one another as, as maybe they're advertised. I mean, there are some that are, mm-hmm. are quite different. I'm a physicist that wish, wishes I was a group theorist, which, which means <laughs> I know enough group theory that I wish I really knew group theory. Mm-hmm. But quantum mechanics is very, enti- very tied in with this mathematical structure called group theory. And so when you look at quantum mechanics as a, a bunch of um, basically transformations on the states of things, uh, the rules that you set down in the in the postulates of quantum mechanics, things like interpreting the, the the state amplitudes in a particular basis and how they relate to the probabilities of the outcomes of measurements, uh, that's a pretty clear cut interpretation of of the theory. In other words, mm-hmm. what I like to focus on is, I mean, ironically, I'm I'm, I'm you know I'm a theorist and I, I'm really unqualified to do experiments on much of anything. You know, at the end of the day, the gold standard of the theory is is what you can predict about experiment. Right. If we can use this machinery, this wonderful mathematical machinery that seems to describe phenomena at the atomic and, and, and single photon level, uh, and then people can do experiments where they need to measure phenomena at the single photon and, uh, and, and atomic level, and if we're right to 11 decimal places... That's kind of a self-evident interpretation that, that right. whatever it is, whatever the mathematical machinery is that we're doing must be accurate enough to explain or to describe this stuff in a way that's meaningful. In other words, it's got, it's got an actual functional use. In other words, we can predict right. things. We can even design. A lot of my research nowadays is about using these rules of quantum mechanics uh, to, to try and optimize and design things in, within the context of silicon nanophotonics that are supposed to help shuffle information around as, right, as, as right. I think we even talked about in a previous podcast. Mm-hmm. But, um, but, but I, I think there's a huge tendency. I mean, it's a weird theory. It's not the kind of thing that, that, that you see in everyday life. Um, you have to, you have to adopt a quantum mechanical way of thinking about, about things. And you, right. you have to sus- basically suspend your disbelief and, and, and actually um, uh, calculate according to these rules of, of, of uh, algebra and probability in order to make sense out of what's going on in any kind of physical system. Right. And so there is a fair amount of interpretation that goes on. In other words, if I, if I calculate a statistical result, I must interpret that result relative to an experimental situation. Right. I, I mean, probably it's a disappointing answer, but I, I never really sit down much and think, am I using the Copenhagen interpretation or, uh, you know, uh, there's a guy named uh, Ballantyne out at UBC who, uh, who, or at Simon Fraser, I think, who has this uh, statistical description that he likes. Mm-hmm. He wrote a textbook about it, and all of them work. I mean, they, 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 they all, this, you know, if you, you, you can look at the stuff of David Bohm, and it's a different take on the same sort of right, be very different take, and yet yeah, the predictions but, come out to right, be the same right, way. Yeah, yeah, and so, so, as we said uh, previously, I look at it. From a more utilitarian point of view, it's a tool. It's the best tool in the mm-hmm. box for calculating some things that, that I want to calculate. I don't think it has a lot to say about why it's that way. In other words, it's a very successful theory for describing phenomena. It doesn't tell us why it's that way. It doesn't it, tell us what things really are. Right. Yeah, these interpretations, remember, these are these are things that we as human beings have come up with as narratives to try to tell us why should right. we calculate this way. Right. But that doesn't mean that it really relates to what's really going on in the fiber of the universe. I right. mean, it's a pretty, 
you got to be pretty proud of yourself before you want to say, I know how the fiber of the universe works. I, I don't. <laughs> I just learned how to calculate certain things about about certain systems with this with this theory. Right. And it seems like a lot of the interpretations, they kind of overinterpret things. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the Copenhagen interpretation is that there's this wave function that there, it's in kind of this cloud state until we observe it, something observe it, and it collapses to a particle. And then it kind of smears and fuzzes out into a wave again. And that's kind of the simplistic thing. And then when you teach it sometimes, you know, you'll see people say things like, well, if a particle goes through a double slit and it creates this interference pattern, that's because the electron is going through both slits at the same time. Which, by the way, is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or, or they'll do like the, the, the idea of particles versus waves. And it'll say, well, the, the object knows whether it's being observed and therefore chooses to collapse into a particle or wave depending on the experiment. Yeah, you can go a little too far with it. And a lot of authors do go a little too far with this sort of thing. Right. Um, with, with trying to somehow humanize what quantum mechanical systems are. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem is that we don't have an appropriate noun for what they are. Is it right. a particle? Is it a wave? Does it behave like a wave or a particle? The wavicle idea. The wave. Oh, yeah, I've seen this term. There are, there are books where they, yeah. they actually use that term. Um, but on, on a practical level, ultimately, it doesn't, doesn't really matter what we call it. Uh, it, right. it matters that we understand how the theory makes predictions. But I just don't think there's a lot of gain to be gotten by sitting around at the local coffee shop and wringing your hands and trying to really stress over what's the appropriate, you know, is this a wave? Is it a particle? That's not the essence of the theory. I think uh, right. I, I, sometimes when I start my undergraduate class in uh, quantum mechanics, I, I try to set the scene. I, I'm not, sh I'm not sure that what I say is accurate or even, even a good idea, but to try to get the students to think about the way quantum mechanics is really used, I sometimes I sometimes describe it as metaphysical signal processing. <laughs> In other words, we get some sort of signal from physical systems. Right. Um, we're not sure if this signal, the way the way that we process it, is actually in line with the 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 fabric of the the cosmological fabric of the universe. But what we do know is that the result of the signal processing is absolutely in line with a hundred year, hundred some odd years of experiment, very, very sophisticated experiment. So it's kind of, um, kind of a forensic argument. I mean, if you, if you have a, if, if you have a theory that is successful at, at describing things on the atom and few photon level, that's so successful that you can plan and, and design experiments that are of exquisite sensitivity. Some of the stuff they do with quantum optics in the experiments. I mean, I'm in that field. I've been in that field for, years and years, and I'm still just amazed at how human beings can, can control light and matter in that way. so finely. I mean, right. it's just unbelievable how finely these are controlled, and there's so many things that can go wrong in an experiment like that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get dust particles, forget it, the experiment's over, and your lab yeah. is probably damaged or something, you know. But, but, you know, so you have to believe, well, you don't have to, <laughs> but it's, it's reasonable to believe that a theory that can help us design and explain and interpret experiments like that and based on those experiments make it progress into explaining other um, un unknown physics you know you have to you have to imagine there's something there I, and, and we don't necessarily know what I can't say what I, right. I mean I, I don't know do I don't you, have do you think there's something underneath quantum mechanics or do you think that's kind of the limit I, of what we can ever know I, I th you know I that's one of those questions I think it's hard to answer responsibly because I don't if there is, I, I don't know about it. But just because I don't know of it, it doesn't mean doesn't there, there isn't. There. You know, there are certainly there are certainly things that quantum mechanics can't do, or at least, or at least we don't yet know how to do them with quantum mechanics. I mean, mm -hmm. quantum field theory is a very powerful thing, and I by, and I don't by any means believe that we've tapped all of its resources just yet. I mean, there comes a time in quantum field theory when the math to describe situations is so so difficult that we don't necessarily know how to do it yet. Right. Um, and, and so there's that, that's, that opens the door for lots of things. You, people have heard about string theory and loop quantum gravity and things that are alternatives to quantum field theory. Um, <clears throat> but I think the, the, the part of the discussion that sometimes gets shoved under the rug is that we're not necessarily done with quantum field theory yet. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not, I mean, there are people way smarter than me who are way farther into this than, than I am. 
uh, that, that really do push the envelope in quantum field theory. And I suppose that they could tell you more accurately what what sort of things people what, what are the open problems in it and what are the possibilities, say, if we were to solve those open problems, would this do something like fix problems with gravity or fix problems with, right. you, you know, with with the strong, strong, uh, strong interaction and so forth? I mean, I don't know that it's necessarily important. So even if there is something underneath quantum mechanics, I don't think it'll go away. Right. The same reason why classical, I mean, you want to fire a rocket from Mars and hit the moon a few days later. Classical mechanics works pretty well, right? right. They, they did right. that, from what I understand. Yeah. Um, so classical mechanics hasn't gone away. They still sell classical mechanics books. You yourself have been assigned classical mechanics classes right here <laughs> at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Because it's useful, it's it's it's, right. it's 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 the best tool in the box. I wouldn't use quantum mechanics to try to design, uh, you know, to try to try to plan the the flight of a rocket either. You'll, <laughs> you, right. you don't need that. <laughs> oh, that's uh, a whole different thing of how we use different models. Sure, for different yeah. regimes, and they all agree where they should. But there may be places in the world where they there's no reason to suspect that they would agree. Right. Uh, and so quantum mechanics could just be more of the same, another layer of the onion. You know, it could be that there is something more fundamental that fixes the cracks that are in it as we see it right now. Right. And we don't know the outcome, and no one may know the outcome, so it's truly a quantum indefinite state. It is. <laughs> it is. You're listening to One Universe at a Time. We've been talking with Ed Hawk about quantum theory. Up next, Ed and I will talk about the conflict between quantum mechanics and another successful theory, general relativity. So on those possible cracks in quantum mechanics, <clears throat> uh, something that's always bothered me because I do quantum mechanics uh, for, for my work is that it doesn't do a very good job of describing gravity at a quantum level. In other words, right. it doesn't play well with general relativity. Now, in my career, the way I've handled this is I've remained essentially ignorant of general relativity, <laughs> so it doesn't bother me on a daily basis. <laughs> the way quantum theory deals with general relativity is to ignore it. <laughs> well, no, I'm not a rep. I, just me, just me, just me. I mean, there are people smarter than me who, who may think about these things. Right. But I happen to know that you have a certain experience with general relativity and like to know what, what's, what happens. Why does it go so wrong? Well, it's interesting because Newton's theory actually plays with quantum mechanics very well. No, because yeah, just, absolutely. just as you can use you know, electricity and you can say there's a, an electric field and you can quantize that electric field and talk about the quantum nature of that. You can do the same thing with gravity. You can think of a gravitational field and you can quantize that. Uh, the problem comes with general relativity because in general relativity, gravity is not a force or a field in space and time. Gravity is space and time. And the problem is we do quantum mechanics as stuff within kind of a rigid background that works. And when your background is the stuff that you're trying to quantize, it's not clear how to do that. So it's, it's unlike the field theories that take place in a background of space and time. Right. Even if it's relativistic field theory, it's not a problem. Special right. It's still a background of space and time. is very, very straightforward. It's actually very beautiful in quantum field theory. It works essentially better than um, non-relativistic field theory in right. a way. But it's the, the, the problem is that now you're not in that environment, you're trying to quantize the environment itself. Right. And so right. that, what is the breakdown is, 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 exactly? I mean, what, what happened? I mean, are there, are there things we try to calculate that just are off the charts? And uh, Yeah, I mean, you can, have, you can have things, you know, go to infinity, you can have things become unmeasurable, they become indefinite, so like the wave function can become something that you can't describe accurately. Because if we have something like an electron in space and time, we can say, well, here's a wave function. But that probability distribution is against a fixed grid. Now you put the electron in general relativity, that probability distribution is within a fabric in space and time, which is then affected by the probability distribution. So your, your distribution is affected by your distribution both of which become indefinite. So the idea of like localized particles becomes difficult in high gravitational fields. And so we do a lot of things what we can do in curved space. So like if you say, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna have some curved space like we do in gravity and general relativity, but I'm gonna say that any system I'm studying quantum mechanically isn't affected, it doesn't affect that background. 
Right. So that's one of the ways to do it. That's kind of semi-classical approach. So we can do Hawking radiation, for example. It says here's the shape of space and time, and then there's stuff in that shape of space and time that doesn't really affect it much because most of it is classical. And we can get some answers out of that, like Hawking radiation and some other things. But if you really want to deal with the quantum distribution affects the quantum nature of gravity, that's unclear. If in, in quantum field theory, people generally consider elementary particles to be point particles, mm-hmm. but they also have mass. So that seems like a problem, right? Because yes. if you have something as zero radius and non-zero and mass, mass. <laughs> I don't, as I said, I don't know that much about general relativity, but I, I mean, common sense would dictate that eventually the, you know, the, the mass density gets so large that right. an electron should be basically its own black hole. That's that's basically. And it. so, is that the problem? Is that is that why the whole that's, thing kind of goes? That's one of the problems. Haywire. And yeah. in fact, there were there have been some theories that have tried to use that to the advantage. So uh, John Wheeler tried something that was geometrodynamics, the idea of trying to do particle physics geometrically. And so, okay. in in that case, he argued that you know, well, what if electrons really were black holes? Hmm. Or what if electron-positron pairs were wormholes? And so, you know, the electric field would go in on one side, go through the wormhole, and come out on the other. One would look like a positive charge, one would look like a negative charge, even though it's just electric fields in curved space. So there was all these attempts to try and do this, and they never they never really work out. Like in the Wheeler idea, there, there would be presumably something he would try to calculate with that. Right. To, as right. a sanity check, because something we know, and it just wouldn't match up. It doesn't, it doesn't okay. work in that way. Yeah. I mean, a, a good one is, is the idea of what's known as renormalization, that in, oh, in field theory, course, yeah. mm-hmm. you can have, you know, what would be infinite energy, but you can reset the zero mm-hmm. because it's really the relative energy that matters, not the total energy. And so you can kind of shift everything. So you can say, well, this basically infinite thing I'm going to call zero, and then all the predictions work. Oh, yeah, of course. And the problem is, okay, you have infinite energy now. Well, that energy has to curve space. If it really is there, then it's going to start collapsing space on itself. Mm -hmm. So you can't just renormalize this. You can't just reset to zero the way you would in quantum field theory. I see, yeah. And so now, is it a real energy or is it a false energy? And if it's a false energy, then quantum field theory needs to fix it. They can't just shift the problem. And so from the field theory perspective, the, the problem is it's compounded by the fact that things like vacuum fluctuations are actually real. Yes. And they cause things like spontaneous emission. Right. Which means, um, well, it's really it's how the light bulbs in this room work. Right. Um, so it is a real thing. But if you take seriously the mode structure of electromagnetic fields, then there should be an infinite amount of it because there are infinite number of those around. Right. And it comes so, into when you look at semi-classical, <clears throat> those quantum fluctuations become very real. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the idea of the quantum fluctuations, Hawking radiation is exactly this. It is curvature of space causing these quantum fluctuations not to zero out. Hmm. And so that's hmm. how black holes evaporate, for example, because you have this event horizon. The quantum fluctuations can occur near the event horizon. Some of them can fluctuate on one side of the event horizon and get trapped. The other ones can fluctuate on the outside and they can't combine back so now they're real. And so basically the curvature of space, the black hole, gives these things energy that can then escape. And that's how it, the black hole I loses see. mass. So we think this is a very real effect. I mean, based upon everything that we've seen, black holes really should radiate. So that people observe this Hawking radiation. We haven't observed the Hawking okay, radiation. Okay, I've never it's known. Purely, I'm, yeah, I mean, no, I've heard it for the years. I've never known if people have measured it or... or, or. Yeah, no, we, we, haven't, we haven't even seen the black holes directly we look at the indirect evidence of it but we can't even see the radiation coming off of an event horizon but all of the stuff that points in that direction i mean if you say if black holes don't radiate then they violate the laws of thermodynamics because they have no temperature Mm -hmm. they're at absolute zero and and that wouldn't make any sense so if you have quantum fluctuations that would agree with kind of semi-classical quantum field theory and it would agree with thermodynamics and it's the least combative. It's the path of least resistance. There is a possibility that it could be wrong, but then there are major more problems that we give rise to. 
So if, if they're wrong, then, then we have problems with thermodynamics. We have problems with, you know, information. We have problems with a whole bunch of other things. And so it looks like that's what they happen. It looks like quantum fluctuations really are real. But doing a full quantum field theory, the universe would collapse in on itself. <laughs> and it doesn't. Well, not so far. <laughs> not so far. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's interesting because if you try and do this on a, on a large quantum scale, you start getting into really weird ideas. So one of them is that, you know, the universe could, in fact, be in a false vacuum state. So, hmm. so now what, would, what, what would a false vacuum state entail in that context? Well, if you, if you think of like in an atom where you have an electron that goes from a higher energy to a, le- a lower energy, but not the ground state. So it's in a metastable oh, so, state. Oh, so, so, right, okay, so. Right. right, so the universe as a whole, the structure of space-time, could have collapsed into a metastable state. And if that's the case, then the entire universe could collapse in a vacuum at any instant in so time. So it could, it, could tun- it could tunnel back into the <laughs> actual could, vacuum. It could tunnel into the actual vacuum and everything <laughs> around us would be destroyed. And we'd, we'd never be able to, to uh, predict that or anything. It's certainly a powerful argument for re- revolving credit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you get, you get other things, too. Like if you get, if, if the universe is a quantum fluctuation, which is one of, one of the things is that if, if you say, well, on a cosmic scale, the universe could begin as a quantum fluctuation. Well, if it begins as a quantum fluctuation, what's more likely, the entire universe or the simulation of your brain thinking that you live in a quantum universe. In other words, it's called Boltzmann's brain. And the, oh, yeah. I, the idea with this yeah. is that if, if you're talking about something fluctuating into being, fluctuating an entire universe into being seems vastly more unlikely than fluctuating a small pocket of space that contains what it seems to be a brain thinking it's in a universe. Hmm. And so you get these weird ideas. And, and the problem is, you know, we kind of look at them and go, well, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, move along. There's got to be some problem with them. But they're always kind of there in the background. There's a, you know, without a fully quantum theory of gravity, we can't fully discount them. Right. And that, that becomes problematic. You've been listening to One Universe at a Time. We've been talking with Dr. Ed Hawk, Assistant Professor of Physics at the Rochester Institute of Technology. One Universe at a Time is produced by Mark Gillespie, recorded at the Rochester Institute of Technology with support from the RIT College of Science. Thanks for listening.